Last year, uh, Kay and I run Epic like a mom and pop shop, so we open all the envelopes and enter all the data. And when uh, Victor Novosky's um, membership came in, I said, oh, this is the person we have to get to come and speak to us. And, um, and he's very busy working on a new book, and so wasn't willing to commit to a talk. And then, so Michael, Michael Rosenthal and I discussed this, and came up with what I hope is the first of many um, exciting conversations that EPIC has. You know, one, one of the jobs that we have in EPIC is to celebrate ourselves, because nobody else is going to, um, and we have a, a serious job of, of archiving our lives and our stuff, of all the things that we've worked on, and I don't know about you, but you go in your house and it's filled with all of this material, which isn't worthless, but has to be put together in, in formats that are useful for other people and that, that, pay, that are respectful of, of the content in your work. And, um, and this kind of oral history and, and interview, I think, is one of the ways that we can archive um, and, and communicate who who we are, so we're really lucky to be in this absolutely beautiful room. I was thinking the last time I was in this building was when I was in high school, because I was editor of my high school newspaper. But, um, uh, but we we lucky to have journalism co-sponsor this um, uh, with us. And um, so thank you for coming. Um, think about who we should work on next. Um, we have, uh, I'd like to do this at least once a semester and, and stream it and then have it be in our, in our, on our website as part of, of um, our EPIC collection. Um, and today, uh, uh, we're really lucky to have two extremely talented members of the Columbia faculty. Um, Michael Rosenthal is going to um, be in conversation with Victor Navosky. My Michael is the uh, Roberta and William Campbell Professor of the Emeritus of the Humanities and if you were lucky enough to hear him talk last semester, I think, about his, his new bi biography of, of Barney Rossett, you'll, you'll, you'll know that um, the extent of, of scholarship and, and, and charm that we're up, up for here. And then we, um, he's a member of our steering committee, and I hope will help us put together future, future conversations. And our, our uh, guest of honor and our conversationalist is um, uh, Victor Novosky, uh, long l emeritus uh, editor of The Nation, winner of the National Book Award, enormous number of, of contributions, teacher um, and scholar. And so we are really lucky to have this today. And thank you very much for doing it. We, we, we are lucky. We did trap him by, by first saying, would you talk? And then he said, well, I'm trying to finish a book, so it's a problem. And then Jean came up with the fiendish notion that he should not have to prepare a talk, that we should just, I should grill him and question him. And then he, had, he was defenseless, and he said he would do it. And so we are, we are very pleased. Um, Jean talks about all of his, Victor's many distinctions, his National Book Award, his uh, I.F. Stone Award, Medal, um, all the things he's done as editor and as a writer. Um, the one distinction that people actually don't know uh, that Victor earned, um, which is, I think, very important, and I know Victor appreciates it, is that he made the list of the 101 most dangerous academics in America, um, <laughs> which is no mean achievement. And, and my first question to Victor is how he managed to do that, since there are lots of awful people around Victor struck, has always struck me, he's not as an awful person, but, um, so Victor, how did you manage to, to get on that list? I think they forgot to fact check the list. <laughs> <laughs> you think you didn't deserve to be on it? Uh, well, I hope I did, but I suspect I didn't. <laughs> well. But I was very proud of it. It's yes, my yes. Leading achievement. So, <laughs> so Victor um, began his preparation for his distinguished journalist career by going to law school, which seemed like an odd thing to be doing for a, a budding journalist. So I wonder, Victor, what 
why you did that and how that shaped your, your career? Well, I, I actually began my journalistic career not by going to law school, but by going to Camp Tahoney, where I wrote for the camp newspaper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I went to the Little Red Schoolhouse in Elizabeth Irwin, where I put out a parody of the school newspaper. The school newspaper was called Info with our genius. We put out a parody called Afni, which is Info spelled backwards. So this is my introduction to the world, the beginning of the world of journalism. And then after, and I edited my college paper and at Swarthmore, and I went into the army. And of course, they ask you when you go in what your interests are, and I told them, my interest was journalism, so after basic training, they sent me to a medical company <laughs> and, uh, in San Antonio, Texas. And at the medical company, they asked us where we, what we wanted to do with the rest of our military career. The draft was on at the time, and it was a two-year draft. And uh, I had a friend whose family you know, Phil Landek, who I roomed with this while well, you knew his mother. And Phil had a job with the information office just outside of Washington. He told me if I could stay off an overseas roster, he would request me to his office in Washington. So when they asked what I wanted to do, I said, I don't care what I do, I just want to stay in this country. So as it turned out, everyone who said they wanted to go overseas got sent to Paris. Everyone who said they wanted to stay in this country got sent to Alaska. <laughs> so Phil never got to request me. So, but in Alaska, when I got there, I went to the local newspaper on base, the 53rd Inf News, and volunteered to be the correspondent for the medical company to the, to the mimeo, this mimeograph sheet that they put out. And I, uh, and I used to file regularly every week, which none of the other correspondents did. So when the editor of the paper was rotated out of there, they asked me if I wanted to be the editor, and I became the editor of the 53rd Inf News. <laughs> One of the reasons that I was happy, I didn't, um, not a pacifist, but I was not in favor of the Korean War, which was just winding down. And uh, I, was, I was okay with being drafted because um, you got the GI Bill in right, those right, cases. Right. And I knew that I wanted to carry on my education. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was interested in politics. I was interested in writing. And it seemed to me law was a place where you could practice and then you could do politics and write from a legal situation. So I applied to law schools. I ended up going to the Yale Law School, which is a great education in every way except I learned no law. <laughs> at the Yale Law School at the time, you could, at most law schools, most of the curriculum was uh, required. You. But at Yale, all you had to do was take contracts, public, public law, and procedure, and torts. And the rest of it, you were free to take whatever you wanted. And they taught a course called The Philosophical and Anthropological Foundations of Law by FSC Northrop, which I took. They taught a course called Freud and Jurisprudence, which I took. They taught a, my friend Fred Rodell, who actually hired me, uh, taught a course called Law and Public Opinion, where it was writing about law for non-lawyers. It was the only writing course I ever took in my life, and you weren't allowed to use any legal phrases in, in what you wrote. And Fred was famous for writing an article in 1936 in, I think, the West Virginia Law Review called Goodbye to Law Reviews the first sentence of which I committed to memory was, there's two things wrong with all legal writing. One is content and two is style. <laughs> he, he vowed never to write another footnote, and he never did. And then he hired me as his research assistant. So, so that was my legal, my, the legal part of my law school 
career. But while I was there, I started a political satire magazine yes. called Monocle, as in Monocle, and our motto was, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And when I then, and that was my law. Would you, experience. was there something about Yale that generated the notion of Monocle? Had you gone to Harvard or to Columbia, would it have all been the same? I can't speak, not having gone to Harvard or Columbia mm. for law school, I can't speak to that. But Yale was a place where I made lifelong friends and uh, where uh, it was intellectually a very exciting place to be at the time. And I was glad to, to go through the law school, even though, as I said, <laughs> I didn't learn that much law. Um, but it's hard to know the answer to that question, but it's a good question. Well, I'm just interested in, in how Monocle sprang up out of New Haven and Yale. Okay. Well, one of the ways, it's, this is not how it sprang up, but one of the things about New Haven at that time, in addition to the law school, they had a great school of design, an art school. And I went to the art school and asked and, and met people who I asked to design our magazine and they could get credit for it in, in the school. And we got a great designer named Lou Klein who went on to a distinguished career as a magazine designer. And he designed our magazine. And uh, they had a lot of brilliant young people there as students who later ended up writing for our magazine and, and have gone on to distinguished careers. The one who I, I am most closely in touch with, although he libels me all the time, is Calvin Trillin. Right, right. He's a humor, who wrote a humor column for us and used to, and called me the wily and parsimonious yes, Victor exactly. <laughs> He called me parsimonious because we were paying, we paid him the same thing we paid everyone else, which is a dollar or two an article. But once we, he, he, was, he got a job when he got out of Yale working for Time Magazine where he covered de the, de this, the South. And uh, he ran a conversation with uh, a couple, two or three other people who covered the South. And my now wife, Annie Navasky, transcribed the conversation. And uh, so instead of paying him, we sent him a bill because I told him it cost us more to transcribe the conversation <laughs> than uh, we had planned to pay him. And, and, and we remained friends. And right. C.D.B. Bryan, who was another Yale undergraduate, started writing for our magazine. And so it was a place where we had artists and writers and, uh, and I had a, a co-author, I mean a co-editor named Jerry Needleman, who was a metaphysician and a very brilliant guy. And uh, so it was a natural place, whether if I'd gone to Columbia or Harvard, who knows. Mm -hmm. Well, did, did Monocle's, was it, was it your, you and a few colleagues deciding to, I mean, it's rather an unusual, achievement to, to run a political satire magazine at Yale at, at law school. Um, how did that come about? Uh, well, we had the idea and we started publishing it and the, the, the dean of the law school was then Eugene V. Rostow, whose brother became famous as part of the Kennedy administration. And he, and because I, Fred Rodell had hired me as his legal research instructor. There were nine of us who had been hired as legal research instructors by members of the faculty. And the nine of us, who included Mike Perchuk, who went on to distinction as the head of the Federal Trade Commission, and we decided we were invited to the faculty tea. And we decided to crash the tea. We thought it was just a pro forma invitation as because we were technically members of faculty. So when I showed up, I saw the dean had a copy of Monocle on his piano. And, his, and, and I told him that this was 
that I, this was a law school magazine, which he had not known. He had just bought it as a, as a reader. And uh, so that was our thing. And then subsequently, when I got out of law school, I went to work as a speechwriter for G. Men and Williams of Michigan. And, and, the, and the way that happened was the dean had working in his office a young woman who also had gone to Swarthmore a couple of years behind me. And she came to me one day, she said, listen, what do you think of Sophie Williams, who was then the governor of Michigan? I said, well, next to Chester Bowles, I think he's about as good as any Democrat there is in the party and a uh, very progressive guy. And she said, well, he, the dean asked me to put together the resumes of some speech writers. Do you mind if I include your resume in with it? I said, no, but I've never written a speech. And I later discovered that because I had never written a speech, the dean, in the cover letter to a friend of his who was working for Sophie at the time, said nice things about me. And uh, because I had zero speech writing experience, and they mistook that for his endorsement of me over the other people <laughs> whose resumes were sent out there. And I got invited to go out there for an interview, and they hired me as a speech writer. And I kept the magazine going through the mails and with uh, uh, and Mike Melsner, who was a year behind me in law school, became our publisher in absentia when I was in Michigan, and a fellow named Larry Pearl, who went on to work in equal employment legal capacity, was became co-editor, and they carried on in my absence. And then uh, when Kennedy got elected. I was invited to go with Sopi to, uh, he became Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, to work with him in the State Department in Africa. But I decided to come back to New York to see if we could convert our money losing magazine into a business. And uh, so that's. Had you raised money for, and you found backers for this magazine? I remember the magazine. It was tall and thin and strange. And Anybody else remember Monocle? I mean, it was, it was good. Great. We <laughs> called it as tall as time and as wide as Reader's Digest. So that way, our theory was that a one column ad in time could be a half page in Monocle and a full, pay, full page ad in the Digest could be a, a three quarter page ad in Monocle. But of course, none of those advertisers advertised in our magazine. Uh, but I did, I, I did, when we decided to become a, uh, we wanted to be a monthly magazine, and uh, I went out to raise the money for that, and instead we became what I call a radical sporadical, <laughs> which meant we came out like the UN police force whenever there was an emergency and whenever we could solve the financial crisis. But the fact was that in the end, I raised a fair amount of money. We, we had a, a circle, and I did raise money for it, and uh, I made, and we raised $100,000, and then I went out to raise a second. I w went back to try and do it again, and I made the mistake of telling everybody that we had terrific investors, Mrs. Marshall Field, uh, the late Jacob Kaplan, uh, who it turned out later had given money to the CIA as well as us. Uh, and I made the mistake of telling each of them that if they would agree to, to do what they did before, that we would keep going and expand. And Kaplan said to me that I, I should talked to his daughter, Joan, who became Joan Davidson, who ran the New York State Council on the Arts and is still with us and a great woman. Uh, he said, Joan is the intellectual in the family. If you can persuade her that I should come back and, and come back to the magazine, I'll do it. So I met with Joan. And the problem with Joan was she's a very smart woman, but at least as I saw it, had no sense of humor at the time. So <laughs> for a satire magazine, she was not the ideal person. Nevertheless, she said to me, look, here's what we can do. We can buy however many thousands of copies. If you can take that as an 
the equivalent of an investment, uh, I'd say yes. So all the other investors, Mrs. Marshall Field, a guy named Phil Stern, they were great people. They all agreed to come back. And then I, we had an office at the time at, 13th, at 14th Street and 5th Avenue, and it was across the street from Jack Kaplan's office. And I was coming to work one day, and I was, got off the bus, and Kaplan was walking down the street, and he stopped me, and he said, listen, you're a bright young man. You're a very bright young man. Why are you wasting your life putting out this magazine? I said, well, Mr. Kaplan, your daughter kindly agreed to come in. He said, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> and uh, he said, here's what I'll do for you. I'll put up half the money if you can get Phil Stern, who was an heir to, the, uh, to some fortune, to put up the other half. And I knew Phil wasn't going to put up half the money. And uh, I said, well, but that's not the deal that we had. He said, well, but that's my offer to you. And he pulled out. And at that point, I lost the enthusiasm for raising money for Monocle. And, and meanwhile, I had started writing for other magazines, principally the New York Times Magazine. And they hired me as an editor, and I went to work at the New York Times. And so you gave up Monocle after, what, five years well, or so? Well, we called it a leisurely quarterly, and it kept coming out for some years after that. But eventually, our last issue, I think, was in 1959. Some people may think that we're still coming out. You never know. Uh, Did you have subscribers? It's not too late. It's not too late. Uh, we could do it again. It's not that we have subscribed, but we have the children of editors and people <laughs> who are working there who want to write our history and want to keep it going in life. And so here we are. Okay. So you were in New York. You were no longer doing Monaco, but you were now a freelance writer. Or and then you connected free, yourself to the Times. I was a freelance writer writing mostly for the New York Times Sunday Magazine, and then they offered me a job as an editor, and I took it, and... Uh, Why did they do that? What had you done wrong or right? The Times is as fallible as anyone else. <laughs> they made the mistake of hiring me, um, and uh, I did it. They did it. I guess everything I wrote for them, they published, and... Uh, and I, I, it was a great education for me working there. Partly the education was because the editors that I worked with and for, some of them weren't talking to each other. Mm. So one of them worked on my right, and one of them worked behind me, though my boss worked behind me. And uh, the, the one who worked on my right, a very talented writer and novelist named Jerry Walker, uh, the one who was behind me was a poet, Harvey Shapiro. And Jerry used to refer to Harvey as the little gnome. Harvey was small. And, and Harvey would refer to Jerry as the Jewish prince. <laughs> so they both would communicate through me mm -hmm. rather than to each other. And this was a part of what work life was like at the magazine. And uh, the, at, at that period, there was this thing called the Sunday Department at the New York Times, which was presided over by a guy named Dan Schwartz. And he would have a daily meeting to discuss what should go in the magazine. And the meeting was like an orchestra of preference, of, an orchestra, hierarchical orchestra, and he would listen to what people said based on their jobs at the magazine, but he was making 100% of the decisions with 90% of his time, and he wasn't the editor of the magazine. The editor of the magazine worked for him, a fellow named Louis Bergman, and Louis Bergman was a genius editor, and I really admired and liked him. I totally disagreed with him politically, but the times you're not supposed to have your own politics. I never changed my politics, but but I survived the system, and uh, that was my education in journalism to start. You, you said that when you were you would go to the meetings to 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 um, recommend your articles that you 
for a while found out you were batting zero, that you never got any of your ideas accepted, and then you figured out what the problem was. Right, right. Oh, you've read my book. I have. <laughs> it's a very good book, by the way. A Matter of Opinion. I recommend it highly. So, right. So, the, it turned out after about six, three to six months, I was there, I think, for three months. Um, it was explained to me that I was on trial as an editor, and uh, they would decide whether to renew my contract. And the, the way they would make that decision was based on how many pieces I got in the magazine of, by other people that I had commissioned. And I did a quick total and realized that none of my pieces had gotten in the magazine that I'd commissioned. And so I had to quickly rethink that. And, uh, and I realized that one of the ways that one of the ways to get pieces in the magazine was to, I thought my job had been to discover new writers and come up with new ideas, but one of the ways to get pieces in the magazine was to pick writers who had survived the system before. So I started, instead of identifying new writers, putting in all their old writers, and they all got published at this point. And then I, instead of batting zero, I ended up batting a thousand, and then I gave them some new and interesting ideas. And uh, once you had survived that system, they renewed my contract, and I was there for life if I wanted to be, so. But politically, you were, you were sort of um, out of the mainstream of, of, of times. I mean, they didn't see me that way. Um, I was maybe internally, but I did not try to inflict my politics on the magazine. But I came up with ideas that were different for them. For example, uh, I mentioned my colleague Jerry Walker. He had written an article, he had written a novel called Cruising, which was about a homosexual murder. And one day I went to lunch and in the restaurant was Jerry and he was there with a writer named Merrill Miller, who was a great writer and very funny and very smart. And I had known Merrill's wife. We were in a political club together. and. Uh, and Merle was talking to Jerry about his novel, and at the lunch, Merle said, well, it's a, it's a very good novel, and one of the good things about it is you've captured what it's like to be a homosexual. And I know that because I am a homosexual. Who knew? So I said to him, Merle, would you be interested in writing that for the magazine? He said, I would love to, to but they'll never publish it. So I went back and I proposed that Merle Miller write an article for the magazine about what it was like to be a gay person. And lo and behold, uh, and the Sunday editor was then Dan Schwartz. The Uber editor at the Times was Abe Rosenthal. And everybody liked the idea, including Dan, but Dan said, Abe will never go for it. <laughs> so it turned out Abe went for it. They did publish it, and then Merle became famous and wrote a book about it. And uh, so you could get things through the system without, you, without being identified as a radical in that point. Um, during that same period, um, this sort of strange and wonderful book, um, uh, the report from Iron Mountain came out. Were you, you were at the, times, at, the, at the time when Iron Mountain? Well, it's complicated. When I was at Monocle, we started a line of books to pay our bills. And, and we had an idea for a book. And the idea we had, suppose when Kennedy had been president, Kennedy was killed by this time I was still at Monocle. Suppose uh, that Kennedy had commissioned a report on what was to, how to make the transition from a wartime the Korean economy to a peacetime economy. And the people who were writing the report concluded that you couldn't have a peacetime economy, it wouldn't work. You needed the threat of war to make the economy work. What would happen? So the premise of this book was going to be that this report had been quashed. And uh, I went to a friend who had written for Monocle already named Leonard Lewin and asked him if he was interested in writing the story of the quashing of this non-existent report. And Leonard said, yes, he was interested, but he said, 
in order to write of the quashing of the report, there has to be a report to be quashed. So he made up the story of that there was a group that met at Iron Mountain, which was a facility where they buried uh, secret uh, documents underground, that they met underground in secret, and that they had written this report, which was called Report from Iron Mountain. It was a brilliant parody of think tank ease, and, uh, and it was eventually quashed. And uh, that report, uh, we sub we he wrote a, this brilliant report, Report from Iron Mountain, and we wrote an introduction, the story of, of how it was quashed. And we went to a publisher named Richard Barron, who was the publisher of Dial Press, and they had a young, new editor-in-chief named E.L. Doctorow. And E.L. Doctorow had not yet become famous for the novels that he wrote. And they, together, agreed not to tell the sales force that this was a satire, a hoax, but to present it as if it were a real report that was quashed. The result was that they put it in their catalog, and the New York Times got a copy of it in advance, and the reporter for the Times, a guy named John Leo, who was a friend but very conservative guy, he uh, said, is this real? And uh, I said, John, if, if you don't believe it's real, why don't you check the footnotes? And all the footnotes were real footnotes to real <laughs> articles. Leonard Lewin had put in two that weren't real, but it, they were all supposed to be real. And so he took the footnotes, the footnotes were all real. So they called the White House to find out if this report <laughs> was real. And instead of denying that it was, or saying the, the, it was the Johnson White House, and they said, we don't know. <laughs> and uh, the result was there was a front page article in the New York Times saying that this possible hoax, this possible satire was a possible real report. <laughs> front page, it got on the bestseller list, and that was the report from Iron Mountain. So it did sell? as We did well, yes. <laughs> and and did, did it sell because people understood that it was a parody or because they thought this was the secret report that had been quashed? Both, mm -hmm. because there were, rep there, were re there were articles in magazines that took it very seriously and said this has to be true for the following reason. There were other people who did not take it seriously, so. One point in it that I thought was quite brilliant, and I don't know whose idea it was, that examining the, the committee that wrote the report and, and um, the author or whoever, I guess, the author explains that that they did blood tests of all the, all the um, contributors, and they found that there was a high level of uric acid in the bloodstream. And right. I thought, that's brilliant. I mean, it's <laughs> Leonard Lewin. That was, was Leonard his Lewin. idea. Yes. Well, he had a high level of uric acid in his blood, so he understood that. I see. Okay. Um, so during this time, were you a subscriber to The Nation? I was brought up in a house that had The Nation and The New Republic. So it was part of my uh, environment, my youth, and my life. And I kept subscribing to both of them throughout. Yes. So you were, you were an editor uh, at the Times. Yes. Um, and then you were writing things for the nation, or you just? OK. I wrote a, a book review or two for the nation. But essentially, I left the Times to write a book that became a book about Robert Kennedy's attorney generalship. And uh, uh, I wrote that while I was still at the Times. And then I left to write a book that became a book called Naming Names about the Hollywood blacklist. And, uh, and then I did what you're not supposed to do as a journalist, which is that in the course of writing the Robert Kennedy Kennedy Justice book about the Kennedy Justice Department. I had interviewed the head of the Lands Division, an attorney named Ramsey Clark, who was the son of Supreme Court Justice Tom Clark from Texas. And I came to admire Ramsey a lot. And uh, when and Johnson, when he became president, he uh, somehow he appointed Ramsey as Attorney General. One of the reasons he did it was 
so that Tom Clark would resign from the court so that he could appoint Abe Fortas to the court. And uh, Ramsey became attorney general, and I wrote a piece about Ramsey for the Saturday Evening Post as attorney general. And when I went to interview him, at the time, the conventional politicians like Johnson and others would refer to extremists of both sides, by which they meant the NAACP on one side and the White Citizens Council on the other. And I asked Ramsey about that, and Ramsey said, you know, I would be a member of, of the NAACP, but I'm not a joiner. And it, it was very unusual for an attorney general to talk like that. And uh, so I wrote this article about him, which is Saturday Evening Post, and, and quoted a, a right-wing columnist named Holmes, I forget his first name, but who said he was the wrong man for the wrong job at the wrong time. And the Post made that the headline, wrong man for wrong job at the wrong time, question mark. And uh, I became a friend of Ramsey's. And when Ramsey left the Justice Department to run for the Senate from New York, I did what you're not supposed to do as a journalist. He asked me to be his campaign manager, and I ended up as his campaign, I called it campaign mismanager. But, but, he, but the reason that he, he asked a journalist to be his campaign manager was he was way ahead of his time and he announced that he would not take more than 100 bucks from anybody. So, because he understood the evil influence of money on politics. And uh, so, and I understood the hundred, how you raise money in $100 increments because I had understood the direct mail business from my life at Monocle in the magazine business. And uh, I went to a, a old college classmate, Paul Gottlieb from Swarthmore, who by that time was the president of American Heritage, which did a lot of direct mail, and asked him if he'd be the campaign finance chairman. And he ended up as the finance chairman. And, uh, uh, and I was uh, Ramsey's campaign mismanager. Uh, but I, I had signed up to do this book that became Naming Names, and uh, while the campaign was going on, a young man named Ham Fish, who had just gotten out of Harvard, who was the son and grandson of many famous Hamilton Fishes, um, he came to work for us as a fundraiser and uh, was very successful because one of the reasons was if you worked for a left-wing candidate like Ramsey Clark and you got a call from Ham Fish on behalf of Ramsey, everyone would take his call. And, uh, and while he was working on the campaign, the great Marcel Lofels, who was a documentary filmmaker, had made a film called The Sorrow and the Pity. A story appeared in the Times saying that he was fired from his job making this new documentary because it was supposed to be an hour-long documentary and it was up to four hours and he was still working on it. And Ham wrote him a letter saying, if I raise the money to help you finish your film, would you finish making it? Offels wrote back and said, yeah. And by the way, and you can be the producer. And, I, and, and then that happened. And then a story appeared in the paper about how the nation was for sale. And uh, I told him, you ought to do for the nation what you did for Marcel Ophuls. Uh, raise the money and, uh, so that they can survive. This is a great publication. It's America's oldest weekly magazine. And Ham went and met with the publisher, a man named James J. Starrow, Jr., and uh, came back and said, look, there are 24 different groups that have come forward to buy the magazine. But, you, but yes, it's for sale, and uh, I'll, I'll do it on one condition. I said, what's that? He said, that you agree to be the editor. I said, Ham, I can't be the editor. I quit the Times so that I could write this book about the Hollywood the blacklist, and I'm in the middle of, of working on that book. And he said, well, suppose you don't have to start till you finish your book. And I said, I have a wife and three children to help support at this time. And 
That's my wife right over there who just <laughs> walking back to the table, those of you who are interested. And so I said, well, I can't do that. I have a book to finish. I have a wife. I have three children. He said, well, suppose you don't have to start till you finish your book. Suppose I pay you whatever the Times was going to pay you, was paying you. And suppose you tell me how much money I have to raise to do it. And I raise the money. And suppose you have total editorial authority. Uh, so I said, well, how can you say no to that? And I didn't say no to that. And of course, I had to start before I finished my book. And I had to help him raise the money and ended up <laughs> raising the money to, to buy the nation and to keep it going. And, and then here we are. And by that time, you had stopped with Ramsey's mismanagement. By that time, Ramsey had lost the campaign. <laughs> yes, well, he lost to Jack Javits, who was right. the highest getting Republican vote getter in the country at the time. So it was a very respectable loss, and uh, we only lost by a few hundred thousand votes. And had you been wily and parsimonious as campaign manager as well? Uh, well, the campaign was under, as underfinanced as the nation <laughs> is and as Monocle was, so this was a condition that I lived within, yes. So you left your editorial world of the Times and you took on an altogether different kind of editorial project uh, with the oldest living um, weekly, right? Yes. Begun in 1865 and had lost money ever since? The nation was founded in 1865 uh, by a group of people in and around the abolitionist movement and it claimed that it had lost money for all but three years, but no one could ever identify what the three years were. <laughs> I kept looking for them and couldn't find them. And, uh, the, and, it, and it turned out that James Starrow, the owner, although he had announced that it was for sale, he had glaucoma and he was losing his health, uh, he was really not ready to give up control. So he picked the only group that came forward, Ham, Fish, and Navasky, that didn't have the money to buy the magazine to offer it. And they were selling it for $150,000, but in, it was losing something like a half million dollars a year, and, uh, and you had to raise the money to cover the losses and invest in it to help it grow. And uh, so we figured out we had to raise about $3 million before coming forward. And uh, in the end, that's what happened. So. And you said that one of the many things you liked about um, the nation or loved about the nation was the, the opening sentence of its first. Yes, I, I committed this to memory. <laughs> I'd the hope you would. The first sentence of, you know, think of new magazines. They want to be trendy. Think of Tina Brown, Vanity Fair. What, what? Imagine a new magazine that's launched with the following sentence. This is the first sentence on the first page of the first paragraph of the first article in the Nation magazine, and it's on the cover. The sentence is as follows. The week was singularly barren of exciting events. <laughs> now, I fell in love with that sentence because what it said was not just that there is no news this week, and of course there were all kinds of events, but what it said is you can trust us. We're not going to engage in false hype. We're not going to have false sensationalism that, you know, if you read it here, it's true. And, uh, this was one of the enticements that, that drew me to the magazine, yes. And, you, and during your time, you kept the magazine on that, on that road of... Um, you know, or did you change the magazine? That's really the... Yeah, we, we made all kinds of changes. We, we, among other things, we gave Calvin Chulin a column that appeared every three weeks. We introduced a number of columnists. We brought in Alex Coburn and Christopher Hitchens. And that's when Chulin started calling me the wall and, and parsimonious Navasky, not just because of I had sent him a bill rather than paid him when I was at Monocle. But at The Nation, he kept complaining that he was underpaid. And we paid him $100 a column not a penny more, not a penny less, which was a lot more than the dollar he got for writing for Monocle. <laughs> and, uh, and then 
after a number of years, he stopped writing his column, started writing a weekly poem. And one week he had the nerve to turn in a two or three word poem, which made him the highest paid poet in the country because we kept paying him the hundred dollars. And I've committed that poem to memory. Here is his two or three word poem. It was about O.J. Simpson. The poem was O.J. Oy vey. <laughs> But yes, we kept the same rates going. <laughs> you say that um, the nation was finally more a cause than a business. You did say that. The nation, I think it's lasted 100 and, and <clears throat> now founded in 1865, however many years, because it is the editors cared more about it being a, what it was than about making money. So there's an irony of that, whereas magazines with circulation in the millions have gone under, this struggling little magazine survived all those years. And uh, so. And it still, it goes on in the same financial strange way. It goes on, yes. And we started what we call the circle of 100. 100 people I asked to put in $5,000 a year for three years, and it kept going that way. and then. Eventually, we had an owner named Arthur Carter who came in and he took the pledge to keep his hands off the editorial side, but he was someone who wanted so much to be in control that he started the New York Observer. He sold the nation, he sold it to me for a million dollars that I didn't have, and, but no, but payable $100,000 a year at 6% interest, no money down. and. Uh, I agreed to do it because I thought I had to come and explain to Annie why it was a great deal to buy a magazine that was losing half a million dollars a year <laughs> for a million dollars that I didn't have. But it was the, one of the best choices we ever made and, uh, and the money came in to keep it going during that period. So. And you are a great defender, I think the most articulate defender of, of the significance of the Journal of Opinion. Um, well, yes, I, I believe in opinion journalism, and I think there's a lot of talk about objectivity in yes. journalism. Whatever that means, opinion journalism is open about what it is and what it does, and uh, so. so. You're not a great believer in the possibility of objectivity. I'm a believer in striving for objectivity, but why waste your time striving for something that you can never fully achieve? So I'm also a believer in investigative reporting, which the nation represented, and which in my books, in my Kennedy justice, I tried to do, and so. In your um, naming names, yes, um, several things. One, you talk about, maybe it's not in naming names, but here, about the necessity of not having tape recorders, but actually having notepads and pencils and pens for taking notes? Well, I don't object to tape recorders that I remember, but I, I am handicapped. I never had faith that I could tape accurately. <laughs> so I remember going to interview one of the so-called Hollywood 10. There were 10 Hollywood writers who were accused of having been members of the Communist Party, and they refused to answer the committee's questions, and one of them was a man named Dalton Trumbull, and another a man named Albert Maltz. When I went to interview Al Albert Maltz, he said to me, I said to him, do you mind if I tape our interview? I carried my tape recorder around. He said, I don't mind. In fact, I'm taping the interview myself. This is too important not to tape. So he said to me when I got there, and he said to me, I have something I've written, it was 5,000 words long, and he said, I'll give it to you if you promise you'll print the whole thing. And at that time, I hadn't yet started the book. I was writing an article for the New York Times Magazine called Whatever Happened to the Hollywood 10. So I said, oh, I said, here's the problem. I can't promise to print 5,000 words because uh, the articles in the Times only run about 5,000 words but I can promise to print accurately the sense of what you've written and to quote accurately from it. So he said, okay, and, and the 
article he gave me was an attack on, among others, his fellow Hollywood 10 member Trumbo, because he said Trumbo had made a speech when he got something called the Laurel Award, saying those of you who are too young to remember the blacklist should study it. But when you do, don't look for heroes or villains because there were only victims. And all of us were equally. And, and Maltz was deeply offended by that because he said to say there were only victims, what did we go to prison for? What did we, because they all went to prison because they wouldn't answer the committee's questions and they didn't take the Fifth Amendment at the time. And uh, so this was, this was the message of his uh, article. And it was, to me, news, a newsworthy thing. Um, but when I got back to the hotel that I was at and played it to listen into the interview, my tape recorder didn't work. So I had to, with great embarrassment, call him and tell him, listen, my tape recorder, can I have a copy of your tape? And he gave me a copy of his tape, and then a few days later I went to see Trumbo and uh, to ask him what he thought of Moss's article, and Trumbo was a great character who liked to drink, and he poured us each a drink. And I said, and I made the mistake of, you learn while you do, and I made the mistake of, instead of waiting to the end of the interview, of showing him the Moss article at the beginning. And I said, listen, I saw Albert Moss the other day, and he gave me something uh, that I would like you to read and give me your thoughts about. So he said, okay. So he took, he took the thing and he, he looked at it and, and he said to me, he read it and he said to me, what what my thoughts about this? Fuck Albert Waltz. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm t my tape recorder is working and I have him say, fuck Albert Waltz. I came back to New York to write, to write up the article and the phone rang one day and we were in our kitchen and he said, is Dalton Trumbo on the phone? So, which is a thrill to be called by Dalton Trumbo who is a great writer and a great person in my mind. And he said, Mr. Navasky, he said, listen, when we talked, I think I was in my cups and I said some things I shouldn't have said about the 10 shouldn't be attacking each other. It's the goddamn committee of un-American activities we should be attacking. So would you mind not publishing what I told you about Albert? So I said to him, Mr. Trumbo, don't worry. The Times is a family magazine. They'll never publish what you said about Albert <laughs> Walls, but I want to use it in my book, which I did. So that was my experience with Hollywood 10. When you, in the process of writing that book, um, did you change any of your assumptions about what you were going to find in the, in the course of, of, of researching? Well, I, I don't know that it, the answer probably is yes, um, but no one had really talked to the people who had named names before. Right. And I made a point of talking to the so-called informers. <laughs> and uh, it was a wide range of differences different things I had to say. And uh, so I was very glad that I was able to do that. And some of them refused to, weren't interested in talking to me, but a surprising number were and did, and no one had talked to them before. So this was very valuable to me. And did you understand when, when you began writing that the House on American Affairs Committee had all the information that the people were busy supplying them with, but they already knew it? Because I, when I read your book, I, I was sort of amazed at that. I mean, you, and you talk about the rituals of degradation, which is really what, what you thought those events were, rather than... Right, I thought they were degradation ceremonies, the testimony of these people before the committee. It was a surprise to me that they had all the information that they were ostensibly <coughs> seeking, and the public hearings were rituals and they wanted people to uh, themselves go through this motion of naming other people as the test of their loyalty to this country. And this was during a period when you had J. Edgar Hoover running the FBI, you had the House on American Activities Committee, the Senate Internal Securities Committee, the so-called Attorney General's List of 
so-called subversive organizations. So you had a whole um, sort of map of uh, repression out there, and uh, it was a very effective thing. And um, the so-called informers who later did not do well in terms of their public reputations um, were in charge at that point. Well, it's a very powerful, affecting book, yeah. if I say so myself. Um, you said that you have four um, uh, heroes, journalistic heroes, at one point in, in your book. Uh, do you remember the four? Because no, but <laughs> well, but I have. Well, I'll tell you, my heroes are I have the late I F Stone, and I was privileged to win the I F Stone Medal this yes, last yes, year. Yes. The late Carrie McWilliams, who is an editor of the Nation. Lincoln Steffens, yes. who wrote a great book about journalism, which everyone who is interested should read. And uh, the fourth is the strangest one for me, which was Murray Kempton, uh, the fourth who I think is Murray wonderful, Kempton. but at yes. times opaque and complicated to understand. Yes. Well, Murray Kempton, I don't know how many of you read him today, but he, he wrote uh, in his quirky, brilliant, style uh, and uh, I got to know him a little bit because we live in a in a house in Manhattan at 33 West 67th Street and upstairs um, is a woman was a woman named Barbara Epstein who is co-editor of the New York Review of Books and when her husband who founded it was one of the founders Jason Epstein and she went their separate ways she took up with Murray Kempton and he would come over and visit her, and I would frequently find myself riding down the elevator with him. And we would, he had his bicycle, and I would walk, and he had his bicycle, and he would be testing his column for the next day in the New York Post in our conversation. So I would, we'd have these conversations, and then I'd read it in the paper the next day. But I, he was very smart and very wise and very, uh, uh, po poetic is probably the wrong word, but I would say that he was c as careful as a poet in his use of language. So, no, there were times obscure, I thought. At times, but poets are obscure very too. Very much right? obscure. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. um, I just we have just a few more minutes, and I want to have you talk a little bit about because you are a man of words. But you wrote a book about political cartoons, which is actually quite interesting. Um, how, how that developed such a project. And then I'd like you to talk a little bit about Henry Kissinger and David Levine. Uh, well, let's see. You know, cartoons, as I mentioned, uh, Ronicle's birth, we got, was, the visual part of Monocle is very important. And, uh, we published a lot of cartoonists who later on came to fame at the time that we signed them up. They were unheard of. A guy named Ed Corrin, who became one of the New Yorker's regular cartoonists. A guy named Bob Grossman, who's a brilliant caricaturist. A guy named Ed Sorrell. They, they all came to fame as caricaturists. And, and I got to the point where I felt that you could say things visually and it had a power that words didn't have and I, I and when I wrote this book about uh, the art of, of cartooning I uh, became very self-conscious about the fact that I was using words <laughs> to talk about the fact that cartoons had more power than certain kinds of caricatures and cartoons had more power than words and uh, so, so I said so but I said it in words but I'm not because I'm not a caricature <laughs> I couldn't do it but I, I felt that was a, uh, a lack, and so I was pleased to write about that. But you had a difficult time one point at, at The Nation when David Levine did his extraordinary um, cartoon of Henry Kissinger, and you wanted to publish it, and, and you, there was a, a, a group letter that came to your desk when everybody was outraged at the sexism and so on, and you called a meeting 
Remind me what happened at the meeting. <laughs> well, everybody complained about, about the sexism. Um, it, it's, a, it's a cartoon of Henry Kissinger, which some of you may know, um, covered by an American flag and screwing the world. The Kissinger world. is on top and the yes. world in the form of a woman's yes. body is on bottom and they're under an American flag. And we were accused of being sexist for running this cartoon of Kissinger screwing the world, as it were, that David Levine had envisioned. And, uh, uh, but we were pleased to run it and uh, we, we invited commentary by our readers and we got a whole slew of letters um, some agreeing with the staff members who objected to it. The only people who didn't agree were cartoonists and caricaturists, all of whom who thought it was a brilliant and good thing to do. And eventually the cartoon was, uh, there was a show at Columbia actually of caricatures and cartoons and they went through uh, 150, 130 years of nation cartoons and caricatures, and they picked out the Kissinger cartoon as one to display. And uh, I urge you all to look at it. No, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful, wonderful cartoon. You said that that David Lowe, um, sort of, David Lowe had taken Hitler as his object of of cartooning and caricaturing, and that it drove Hitler sort of crazy. Um, you you include in the book the wonderful cartoon by David Levine of Johnson pointing to the scar in his chest, which is Vietnam. Yes. Um, um, do you think there is, is there a cartoonist, a political cartoonist now who sort of controls Trump in any way that, that you know? I don't think there's anyone who controls him, but I think he fixates on cartoons and television in ways that are easier for him to comprehend than words. <laughs> uh, the last thing I haven't, I mean, there are many things to talk about, but um, what I admire hugely is your Institute of uh, Expertology, of which you are the, um, I think, the chairman of the board, um, which is, a, which is a, a collection of comments made by experts of various sorts. Um, which uh, Victor and his team. My colleague Chris Cerf and I did a book called The Experts Speak, and we said in the introduction, and it consists only of experts in art and in physics and in biology and in politics and in economics of experts who are wrong. <laughs> and in every field, and as we said in the introduction, we were ready, we're ready, we're not arguing that the experts are always wrong. We're ready to concede that they're right as much as half the time. But in our own research, we couldn't find any who were right. So. <laughs> I do have just a few, which I think would be a crime not to, uh, not to read, just so you get the sense. Um, so let me just go over it. I don't know if you have a favorite one. Um, I like Gandhi's um, admiration for Hitler. Um, which I thought was unusual, um, saying that he seemed to be a man of peace who achieved his ends without any sort of violence. I mean, I assume that Gandhi is, a, is an expert of sorts. Uh, you know. um, I do not consider Hitler <coughs> to be as bad as he is depicted. He is showing an ability that is amazing, and he seems to be gaining his victories without much bloodshed. This is Gandhi in 1940. Um, and there are many others um, which... Um, if you can, I just think you should have a few of these. Um, um, Gone with the Wind is going to be the biggest flop in Hollywood history. I'm just glad it'll be Clark Gable who's falling flat on his face and not Gary Cooper. That was said by Gary Cooper, who had just, who had turned the role down. <laughs> um, and then, I will just read one more because I want to leave time for your questions. Um, Tom Watson of IBM um, talking about computers, and you, um, uh, I think there is a world market for about five computers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the one that I, I will not read, because I think it's actually not 
that doesn't deserve to be here is a 16th century comment about how you <coughs> hunt unicorns. Um, and it seems to me that the person who was writing the, the methodology cannot be deemed to be an expert because he, presumably he never found a unicorn. <laughs> but he does have a, a system. Anyway, I want to thank Victor for coming and talking to us. And I want to <laughs> leave some time for questions. I assume there might be some questions. So. There are no questions. I've answered well, I'd them all. Like, I'd like to make a comment rather than a question, which is, of Wait, course, we really greatly appreciate what Professor Fisk is asking. done for us here today, but I want to uh, give some kudos to Michael Rosenthal. The <laughs> Absolutely. The consequence of Victor's being unwilling to do the work of preparing a talk <laughs> is that Michael had to do it. Good. <laughs> he did it so well. Good. My biography of Victor will soon come out. Good. I agree. Very well. um, you mentioned that you've had four heroes amongst journalists. Do you have any heroes amongst successful politicians? Among successful politicians, how do you define success? I mean, ones who achieved office. And you mentioned that Ramsey Clark might have been one of your heroes. Yeah, well, Ramsey was and is, was and is. I mean, you know, I don't want to disappoint you. But I think well of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I think well of Franklin D. Roosevelt. I was brought up with him, but uh, there we are. I think well of Elizabeth Warren, who is with us to this day. So, Other questions? They don't have to be questions, of course. People sometimes feel that under the gun. Yeah, Francis. Do you have any advice for young journalists who are facing very historically unusual um, technological and other, other yeah. challenges nowadays? I don't have advice. I don't trust my own advice. But my observation is that it's never been more important. And uh, the old models, the old business models don't work anymore because of the new online world. And so it's a time for invention and uh, creative, uh, a creative approach to journalism. And don't accept any of the old shibboleths. Uh, so don't be afraid. So I do have a question, if I may. Um, the question is, you talk about the importance of opinion journalism. Um, and you said that, that the nation is more a views magazine than a news magazine. And I'm just wondering whether um, how the power of the nation as a views magazine stacks up against what seemed to me to be also um, uh, views, organs which are, you know, Fox News and and Rush Limbaugh, and which are not which are less about news than they are simply seeding opinions about about politics and culture and so on. So, can 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 the, the journalism, can the opinion journalism somehow do something? positive against what seems to me overwhelming forces of, of mainstream media? Um, the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, the quality of opinion is not merely views. Mm -hmm. It is views supported by evidence and supported by argument and supported by insight and uh, putting together different opinions and is having a, it's all part of a long running conversation. And uh, it seems to me that Fox News and other contemporary, Sean Hannity and other contemporary exponents of so-called conservative opinions, history will make their judge, its judgment about who you want to remember and pay attention to. And I think that they are their own worst enemies. Mm -hmm. My vision of that. So. Okay. 
I hope you're right. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better start for our series than this was, and and in particular, Michael, for the, for your wonderful job of reading and parsing and and being this such an excellent conversation. Um, and thank you for coming and send in suggestions of who should be next in line and there's there's lunch in the back of the room um, and uh, enjoy Great. thank you thank you Great. Victor